Lord Reid, I have a handful of questions to ask um, arising out of uh, your evidence. Um, the, the first is, is this. Um, when you became Secretary of State for Health in 2003, um, did you have, um, as far as you can recall, any particular prior knowledge of um, the fact that people had been infected and, and, and um, the scale of their infection? I'm very hepatitis C. Well, whether the, the people have been infected with hepatitis and or with HIV. I, I had no understanding, as far as I can recall, about the plight of uh, those suffering from hepatitis C. Like most people, I suppose, in Britain, I was vaguely, generally aware <coughs> of the whole question of HIV AIDS. And I think it's only when I became Secretary of State, because of the sequence of events we've discussed today, that I became um, acquainted with the fact that there was this group of people called hepatitis C sufferers who had been treated in a different fashion from the, those who, who were tragically suffering from HIV. And you, you described um, what was um, being looked at in Scotland <clears throat> as a catalyst. Hmm. Um, uh, if Scotland had not taken the steps that it did in, in 2002, 2003, Ross Committee report, and then Malcolm Chisholm in January 2003 and so on, um, um, would the issue of financial assistance for those infected with hepatitis C have ever come across your desk, do you think? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. <clears throat> it's asking me to speculate. It is. It's asking me to speculate, which I'm normally very ret reticent to do. So, but, but I have thought about it. Um, and the answer is, <laughs> I'm sorry, disappointingly, I don't know. Um, clearly, it was brought to my attention, in, in my case, by the fact that Scotland had taken an initiative. Um, on the other hand, people's views about this have been formed by, and you've heard this from witnesses, by all sorts of accidental things, including meeting people who've had uh, hepatitis C and personal meetings and so on. So all of that is possible. It is possible that some other event might have brought it uh, to my attention. <clears throat> but in the, in the event, all of that is speculation. All, we, all that we know is that the thing that was the catalyst for me making the decision was a decision by uh, the Scottish uh, executive to do it. And, and in my statement, and now I give them credit for doing that. I'm going to ask you now to look at two documents with me, um, which you've been given over lunch, so they're not documents that, that had been provided to you before. The first is WITN 1056057. This is a letter dated the 2nd of September 2003 um, from Mrs. Colette Wintle, who was is herself someone who was infected, uh, and by this time was also an active campaigner. Uh, it's addressed to you. It expresses concern about um, the uh, level of compensation that had been um, uh, announced. Um, uh, and then it's also, if we go just to the second page, in the third and fourth paragraph, refers to the quest for a public inquiry sets out various matters in relation to that. And then in the penultimate uh, paragraph, it uh, says, um, um, we would like the opportunity, so this is the last sentence of the penultimate paragraph, we would like the opportunity to show you documents that fully support the need for a public inquiry and a proper compensation package. Um, before I ask you about it, I want to show you the reply and then I'll ask you. So if we go to WITN 1056060, this is a letter from a Mr. David Ray in the Blood Policy Team. It's dated the 9th of October 2003, 
it refers in the first paragraph to Mrs Wintle's letter to you, um, says the Secretary of State's asked me to reply, I apologise for the delay in doing so. And then on the issue of a public inquiry, if we look at the penultimate paragraph, it says, you have requested a meeting with the Secretary of State to discuss a public inquiry into this issue. However, the government does not accept that any wrongful practices were employed and does not consider that a public inquiry is justified. Then there's that same sentence about donor screening that we saw in your letter to Andy Kerr. And then it says the Secretary of State does not therefore feel that a meeting is appropriate. Now, Lord Reid, um, my understanding from looking at the documents and other files is that M Mrs Wintle's letter went through what I understand is called the treat official route uh, and was dealt with by officials um, and, and answered in the way we see here from David Ray. Does it follow from that that you are unlikely to have seen Mrs Wintle's letter yourself? It does. Um, and so the rejection, for example, of, a, of the meeting is a rejection by officials on your behalf, but without necessarily your involvement or knowledge? Correct. Um, there is another letter which was in the materials that were sent to you by the inquiry for your statement. I'm not going to put it up on screen, but it's a letter from another campaigner, a, a, a Mrs. A Ms. Grayson. Uh, it was addressed to Baroness Andrews, and it again sets out the call for a public inquiry. Um, I'm afraid I don't know how that was treated or, or, or who responded to that, but it wasn't addressed to you in any event. Um, you, you, you explained earlier that you weren't aware of particular calls or particular pressure for a public inquiry coming to you. If there are letters coming in to, 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 to ministers that don't come to you, that officials don't ever put before you, you're not going to be in the best position to, to, to judge, are you, what, what is being said about the need for a public inquiry? If there are a, an overwhelming number of letters coming in, uh, that's true. Uh, I was quite careful to say this morning that letters may have come to Melanie Johnson or to other officials, but my impression from the thousands of documents that I have seen about my period is that there was not that overwhelming pressure for a public inquiry during my period, primarily because attention had shifted to the scheme uh, that I was proposing. The reason I was saying this wasn't to say that there hasn't been a demand for public inquiry. Obviously there has. We're sitting at the public inquiry. Um, it was to say during my period, my uh, position was not of great resistance to a public inquiry in the face of evidence and great public pressure for it. I was saying that I didn't see the evidence for it and I didn't see the great public pressure for it. Now, you brought to my attention a letter and you mentioned the second one um, out of, I don't know how many, seven and a half thousand documents. Um, secondly, if you, if you read this letter, it, it, it's quite interesting because Mrs. Wintler herself, who was obviously terribly affected by hepatitis C, and she describes the position she was in there quite movingly, um, says herself in paragraph three, um, or, or paragraph three, I think, I don't have it in front of me now. If we just go back to Mrs. Winkle's letter, please, Lawrence. Um, she says she was a long-term campaigner for, uh, and, and the other lady that you mentioned, I recognised her name from the document she sent me. She was a long-term yes. campaigner. So I'm not, I'm not at all surprised there are letters of this nature, particularly from people who have quite rightly been campaigning for some time for this. What I'm saying this morning and reiterating is that during my particular period, I didn't see any evidence that would have 
got beyond the threshold, given we didn't have any criteria, except that's a very subjective judgment, uh, to persuade me that there should be an <coughs> inquiry. And I didn't feel that there was an overwhelming sort of public concern as expressed in its communications to me uh, by the all party group, by the Haemophilia Society and so on. That isn't to say that they didn't feel it wouldn't be a good thing, but they were concentrating their efforts on uh, amending the scheme um, which they thought was, was faulty. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I'm going to leave those documents there. I, I should say, and this is really for the benefit of those listening, the inquiry will be coming back to the question of calls for a public inquiry over the years and the responses of successive governments <coughs> in the course of a, a presentation in, in the autumn hearing. So we can, we can pick it up with, a, with an overview at that stage um, rather than only looking at um, specific times in office. Um, we can take those down, thank you. Um, uh, Louis, can I then ask you to just to cast your mind back to your time as Secretary of State for Scotland? Right. Your time as Secretary yes. of State for Scotland? Yes. Um, during that time, there was an investigation being undertaken by the Scottish Executive into issues related to how some people had come to be infected in Scotland. Um, now, that was being done by the Scottish Executive obviously post-devolution, it reported in October 2000. But the Scottish office, of which you were head, as Secretary of State, would obviously have... Sorry, I think it's, at that time it was called the Scotland office. I'm sorry, the Scotland okay. office, um, uh, of which you were Secretary of State, would have been potentially in the position to assist that inquiry because the Scotland office had been the responsible body for the delivery of health in Scotland um, in earlier years. I'm not going to ask you about the detail of any of it because I don't understand you to have had any involvement in it, but would you have expected... Should the Scottish executive <coughs> undertaking that investigation have contacted and liaised with and sought information from the Scotland office to inform their investigation? Uh, just in terms of the nomenclature, it gets complicated. Before devolution, it was, as you called it, the Scottish office. Uh, after devolution, it was called the Scotland office. Don't ask me why. Um, if, it, if this was a report, and can I ask you, what was the name of the report? I can't remember off the top of my head. We're going to be examining it in some detail next week. Sorry to be asking no, you no, the No, 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 no. It, it's... Um, uh, it, it's, I don't know whether either Ms Scott or the Chair have got reference to, I haven't got my papers with me. It's not the Penrose me. report. No, 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 that's much later. Yeah. Um, it, it reported in, I think, October 2000. Okay, to if the Scottish it was Parliament. commissioned by the Scottish Executive, i.e. what we now call the Scottish Government, then it wouldn't have reported to us if... Um, it was concerned with events prior to devolution, yes. then uh, I don't know the particular issues concerned, but it may well have asked for assistance uh, in terms of uh, health issues from the Department of Health. I, I don't see that it would have asked from this, for what was the Scottish office and became the Scotland office. I, I think if it was a health inquiry, then, look, I'm just, I'm just speculating because I don't know what this is called, I don't know what it was about, but if they, were, if they were inquiring about health before devolution, I would have thought the appropriate government department to ask for information was the Department of Health because before devolution, all of health was covered by the Department of Health. It's a question I've been asked to ask you, but it may be that you can't assist us for the reasons you've given, because you didn't have any first-hand knowledge of it. I think my answer indicates that I'm not even very... Um, it, 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 uh, it's called the Hepatitis and Heat Treatment of Blood Products for Haemophiliacs in the Mid-1980s, I think is, is, is the, the topic of it. Uh, and the, it doesn't the, ring a bell. And, and the reason for, 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 for raising it with you is the Scottish Home and Health Department, right. which would have been part of the Scotland office, um, or Scottish office, 
uh, um, uh, um, might have held information or relevant to it. And, and it's really, should, should the Scottish executive have been contacting the, the, the Scotland office for information? But I, I don't think, in, in, given your lack of knowledge of it, that you can really assist us any further with that. I, I'm afraid I, I, I can't. It would just be a wild guess. Um, do you know why Jack McConnell... So I'm taking you to 2003 now, and your time as Secretary of State for Health. Do you know why Jack McConnell, rather than simply Mr Chisholm, had become involved in, in the issue about hepatitis C patients? Um, I would assume because it was regarded as a political priority. But again, you would have to ask that about Malcolm and, and, and yes. Jack. Um, the only point I would make about this is that at that time, there was a similar political regime, if you want to call it that, in the UK government as there was in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and therefore, there was a closer element of cooperation in addressing mutual problems than perhaps exists today when there's one political regime in charge at the UK level and one political regime in charge at the, uh, at, at the Scottish level. Um, so it may well have been that because of that and because of the importance that was placed upon the Hepatitis C uh, project, the financial assistance project, by the Scottish Parliament, that the First Minister, Jack McConnell, got involved as well as Malcolm Chisholm, the health minister. But it's really a question you would have to ask um, as to the extent of Jack's involvement. And we, can ask, we can ask Mr Chisholm next week. Yeah. Um, and, and then in, in terms of the parameters of the, 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 the scheme that was set up, if the thinking behind the scheme was trying, was, was the position of those infected with hepatitis C was comparable to the suffering of those with HIV, um, why did the scheme not include a discretionary element, an ability for people to apply for payments on the basis of individual need, which was a feature of the McFarlane Trust? Well, it, yes, it was a different scheme. And I think the phrase I used is that I would like to, to have approximated towards the treatment of HIV. Uh, it wouldn't have been identical because there was... Um, differences between the nature of the HIV infection and the hepatitis C infection. This is a point that was made in order to maintain the pre-existing refusal to have a financial assistance scheme. Now, I've never denied that there were <coughs> differences between them, but in my view, the differences between those two infections did not justify the payment of... Comp uh, I mustn't use the word compensation, the payment of financial assistance to HIV while not doing it to those who suffered uh, hepatitis C. Um, so the scheme, even if we'd had enough money, wouldn't have been identical to the HIV scheme, but would approximated more towards it. Because of the affordability issues, it fell far short of that on, for instance, the dependence and the discretionary element. Um, did you have any understanding of the basis for the payments which Malcolm Chisholm had announced in January 2003? And, uh, you knew what they were, obviously, but did you know why they'd been settled on at that, uh, that, those sums? Uh, I, I don't know. You, you, you'd have to ask you know, this, the Scottish executive why they settled on those payments. My assumption was that, a bit like the Ross report, they went for an initial uh, payment, which was actually, I think, double what Ross had proposed. I think he'd proposed 10,000 first payment, whereas the Scots and then ourselves had gone for a 20,000. But then he'd gone for a much higher second payment, uh, and I assume that the lack of that uh, level was because of affordability uh, in Scotland. Because remember, it wasn't just the Department of Health in England that had to try and find this money. Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland had to try and find it again. So, but again, 
that's just my recollection and my assumption at the time, and it may not be uh, borne out by the facts. You would have to get that from, from the Scottish exec. Um, and um, was it your understanding that the quest, by, by the summer of 2003, when you're looking at this issue, so between June and August 2003, yeah. Was it your understanding that the question of the sums that would be paid in Scotland w was fixed by then, or did you understand it still to be an open issue that was, that was being considered, hence something that Malcolm Chisholm would still be talking about in, in September? Well, my understanding was theoretically it was open, but in practice um, they had indicated the sort of sums that they were minded by, by the certainly by the late summer, by, you know, August or thereabouts, my recollection would be that, yes, because discussions were ongoing between Scotland and England, that it was theoretically open, but in practice, most people knew that the Scots had already said, look, this is what we can afford and this is what we're going to do. And, and that was a template for us because it allowed us to get, you know, the basis of a... An, a UK-wide financial assistance scheme for those with hepatitis C. Um, the last matter is this. Um, I'm told, um, um, and I um, understand this to be right, that um, there was a petition before the Scottish Parliament calling for a public inquiry that um, was before the Scottish Parliament in 1999 and, and still before the Scottish Parliament at the time that your communications with Andy Kerr were taking place in 2005. Do you recall um, whether you knew about that petition, either as Secretary of State for Scotland or, or Secretary of State for Health? As far as I can remember, this is the first time I've heard about it. It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me um, because, you know, campaigners will obviously use as one of their methods of quite properly, of reaching their own objectives, some form of petition. But I have no idea that, uh, wh whether it existed or not. If you tell me it did, then fine. I didn't, as far as I'm aware, I didn't know about it at the time. I don't know the extent of it. I don't know how many people were involved in it. I don't know whether it was, you know, from a representative group or a huge number of people. So I can't really comment. Um, Sarah, those are the questions I'm proposing to ask from those suggested. I'm just going to check with Miss Gray. No, there's nothing Miss Gray asks me to raise. Do you have any questions, uh, sir? Well, I have one, yes. Um, you, you gave us the impression uh, earlier on in your, your evidence that when you came in as a new Secretary of State, uh, you were ruffling a few feathers by departing from a, a pre-existing line. And you may remember that you were uh, referred to a letter which was compiled by one of your civil servants, Mr. Kotowski, who, who used the word unilateral to describe the Scottish action, yeah. a word which you thought, you told us, was inappropriate because Scotland were fully entitled to take an independent decision on health if they should wish. Then you said this, and this is what I want to ask you about. We have a historic line on this, and the problem is that this is challenging the line. And you know, that's kind of uncomfortable for people. Sometimes necessary, but it's uncomfortable. So can you just help with what I think you are expressing as general human behavior or reaction to any way in which that sense of being uncomfortable with change expressed itself in, in the field of health when you were minister? Yes, I, th I think my plans to try within four years to reduce the maximum waiting time from three years to 12 weeks made officials appear very uncomfortable. Uh, because they didn't think it could be done. 
but one of the reasons they didn't think it could be done, and incidentally it wasn't done, it got it reduced to 18 weeks, but one of the reasons that they didn't think it could be done was because it couldn't be done unless I was prepared to buy millions of operations from the private sector. <clears throat> and if you're a, a long-term uh, official uh, working with the National Health Service, the idea that some Secretary of State would be saying, look, we're going to buy six million scans, for instance, because people were waiting weeks and weeks and weeks for scans under the NHS. And yet over here in the private sector, there was these great scanning machines that weren't being used. So it made sense to bring together the unmet need with the unused resources, provided always that it was free at the point of need, in my view. However, this was an uncomf uncomfortable prospect, I'm sure, for those who had thought that everything should be run within the ambit of the NHS. Indeed, I can remember one official saying, when I explained, yes, we were going to do this, and I had a way of doing it. I was going to buy seven million operations from the private sector and deliver them free to, you know, ordinary people who had never had access to the private sector. Not only were they uncomfortable, they were uncomfortable with the Secretary of State doing it and didn't believe a Labour Secretary of State would do it. And I remember one of them saying at a meeting, as an aside, you wouldn't dare do that. To which I'm afraid I responded, just you watch this. Um, and we did. So this is not peculiar, Sir Brian, in my view, and I'm making a general observation about you know, all sorts of areas. It's not peculiar to the health service or indeed the civil service. It's, it's the same in all human progress. The, whether it's science, you know, when people advance scientific knowledge, then it's not always accepted by those who've accepted the pre-existing theories. This is why Galileo was locked away, you know, several hundred years ago, because he was challenging. Every scientific discovery is a challenge to uh, the adherence to the previous thesis. And it's the same with all organizations. Change is uncomfortable. It is difficult. People want to go back to a comfort zone, which is what they've known, what they recognize, um, what they feel comfortable with. And that, that's really what I meant. That's different from saying people felt uncomfortable, therefore they, there was an institutional resistance to change. I mean, the amount of change we brought in during those, Alan Milburn started it, and, and it was very controversial, and I continued where Alan had left off. The amount of change we brought in in the health service was absolutely huge, and I won't go through it, but I can tell you at the end of the day, it had fantastic results for the health and welfare of people in this country. Um, but. It, but it had to be a process of continual change, not just medical. I mean, there was a time when, if you had a vaccination at the local surgery, it had to be a doctor. There was, and when you suggested that a nurse might do it, oh no, it had to be a doctor. Well, we introduced nurse practitioners. There was a time when, you know, the National Health Service would never have bought an operation or a scan of the private sector. Well, we introduced it. There was a time when hospitals got a block grant, irrespective of whether patients were going to those hospitals. Well, we changed that, gave the patients a choice so they didn't have to go to the local hospital if it couldn't give them an operation within a certain amount of time. They could go to another hospital, and importantly, the finance followed the patient choice. All of these things were uncomfortable, they were huge changes, um, but at the end of the day, they were supported by the civil service, and they carried them through. 
Um, but you had to persuade them. There's an apoc apocryphal story, perhaps I'll finish my contribution on, of Nye Bevan, who you referred to one of his quotes during one of your, your questions. And it said that Nye Bevan, when he was forming the National Health Service, was told by his officials, the top people, four good reasons why he couldn't do it. And I, Bevan, listened to them and listened to their arguments and said how much he appreciated it because he knew that they were much more experienced and intelligent than he was. But that's also why he knew that if today they could give him four good reasons why he couldn't have a National Health Service, tomorrow they could give him five good reasons why he could. And therefore, if you carry the civil service with you and listen to them and argue it through, in my experience, and it's only my experience, um, then they, they will act on that, however uncomfortable it is. So your experience and the lesson of, of history, you being a historian, talking about Galileo, amongst other things, is to be aware of entrenched views but also to expect that there will be a resistance in moving from uh, the position you start in to the position you end up in, because you use the expression at the end of the day, um, in which there is resistance to be overcome. Yes, precisely. Uh, and whether the resistance is overcome will depend upon the individual who is in the, in the seat, which requires the resistance to be overcome, or succumbed to? Yes. Um, this is not the forum for a discussion on, on the political philosophy of, of the people to who I no, it, it's to believe get, in. It's but, get... but, but if there was one thing that the new Labour government believed in, it was constant renewal. Constant renewal. Why? Because the only constant in the world is change. And if you don't keep up with that change, you fall behind. Um, and that's what we tried to apply when I say we, Alan Melbourne and myself, we differed over certain things, as will be obvious. But we tried to bring the National Health Service into the modern world for the benefit of the patients and to take the power away from the providers of health, which was the NHS, the people who worked in it, <clears throat> who were very important, but even more important were the owners of the National Health Service. And the owners of the National Health Service were the taxpayers. They were the patients. They weren't the providers. And among those patients were those who were suffering the terrible consequences of hepatitis C. So between proposing the change and the end of the day, in this particular case, there was resistance to be overcome, and it was overcome by, presumably, not only by force of personality, but by argument. What argument in particular do you think persuaded the civil servants that they really uh, I don't to, uh, to stop <clears throat> arguing against what you had in mind? I don't think, uh, I don't think there was one particular argument. I think that it was illustrated, I hope, that our position was unsustainable, that it was unfair, that it ultimately would have to change. Uh, better to do it now that we had a template from Scotland. Uh, that would certainly have been some of the arguments I would have deployed with the Treasury. Um, and I think Paul Boateng in his letter to me, reluctantly agreeing, um, referred to the, the, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something like the p political pressures that you alluded to or whatever. And, and of course, you know, unashamedly, I would have deployed them in order to get the thing through the Treasury. That's part of the democratic debate and argument and political process. Um, and I think I was right then. 
uh, although what we ended up was, in my view, was an imperfect scheme. But it was better than what we had been beforehand. But you, your view of that was that that was a first step. Well, I, that's a bit stronger than the way I put it. But looking back on it, that's right. I mean, what I wanted to do was to get a, a scheme for financial assistance. Um, it was unsatisfactory. I didn't have any plans, so I can't say, you know, my successors didn't do what I would have done. I don't want to give that impression, but, but in my mind, yeah, this is something that could be built upon. Were there obvious gaps in it? Yes, there were. Were those gaps uh, continually exposed in terms of argument by, you know, Mike Connerty and the old party group, the Haemophilia Society, by ALF? Yes, they were. Um, and we argued, yes, but given where we are, this is to be targeted at the, the living suffering. And that, that was true. But it didn't go as far, perhaps, as it should have done by saying, and maybe in the long term we can build upon it, because the minute you say that, of course, then, you know, everything sort of blows up. So uh, having started where you were, which you weren't yourself responsible for, uh, there was a partial but not perfect solution, which uh, you've just told us didn't really go far enough as you now see it. Um, I would agree with the first sentence used. I, I, I would put it in those words I would accept. No, the second part I wouldn't necessarily agree for reasons I don't want that misrepresented. All right. Well, I shall leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lord Reed, is there anything further that you wanted to add? No, I think I've waxed quite eloquent enough on these subjects. But perhaps, first of all, thank you for your courtesy, uh, both of you. Um, I hope it's been of some use in your deliberations, uh, although I was there for a limited period. And finally, I suppose I would just say that it's in the nature of these discussions and government documents on which they're based that we talk about processes, we talk about projects, we talk about finance, we talk about structures. And at the end of the day, it's actually about people and, and especially the suffering of people and the alleviation of, uh, of, of suffering. And I would just like to extend uh, my sympathy and thoughts for those who've gone through the uh, horrendous suffering uh, of hepatitis C and just wish you well in your deliberations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your evidence and thank you for its, its clarity. It has indeed been fascinating uh, and helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So if we could take a short break, perhaps 10 minutes, um, because we need to get the documents up and move positions yes, and so on, and then start with the evidence of, of Miss Blears, with apologies to her for having kept her waiting. Well, 10, ten past three then for Miss Blears. Ten past three.